shifters, you have to bend it towards the mitral valve. And all this happens not on fluoroscopy, but on, uh, we have recorded this just because we wanted to record this case. Otherwise, we don't need fluoroscopy to manage most of the things. Now you see the clip is in mitral position. You see the two views that have been used are by COM and the outflow view. Outflow view, you see the aorta. This is the clip which is open at 60 degree and is holding both the leaflets. So the, you see the AML, how well it is held and see the PML, how well it is held. Once you do that, you know exactly, uh, here you see the clip is little outside. So we pulled the clip back, opened it and tried to hold the leaflets. Now the whole, both the leaflets have been held. Once they are held, we close it. So having closed it, uh, these are the two, two views again. The BICOM view shows some MR. Now, um, you know, um, in this mitra clip, uh, since perfection is so important, uh, this was my third attempt to capture it. And every time we used to see this MR and I was never satisfied. I thought I would want no MR with single clip. And uh, finally, this was a third attempt and it was an NTR clip. And I was still not happy to leave this uh, jet. But I think finally we decided that one and a half to two hours had already passed. That we'll take this clip, see how he behaves uh, on the T after the after uh, removing the clip. If we need, we'll put another one. So this is what we decided after this was the third attempt. Now you see uh, there is some MR, but you see the clip has nicely held on to the leaflets. And uh, now comes the release. Release is also a very integrated process. So this is the clip lying in the left atrium. This is the clip which is open. So you have to position the clip uh, before it enters into the LV. You have to make that position before it enters the LV. And how do we make that position? Uh, this is um, the clip being released and uh, having been released. So how do you make that position? This is the 3D T end phase view. So you see the aorta in front. This is the mitral valve. These are the two leaflets. You see the anterior mitral leaflet is flail. You see the gap when it closes. Now, when you place the clip, you have to place it like this, straight vertical, dividing the mitral valve into two. And you place this in the LA and then push the clip into the LV so that you retain that position. And you are not trying to manipulate too much in the LV because you have cordy and papillary muscle to play with. Now you see this clip is very nicely positioned, perpendicular to this mitral valve, cutting it into two orifices. So the two orifices are there. You see the double mor orifice mitral valve. Uh -huh. This is what, what, what you want to achieve. This is the pulmonary vein, which was reversed. It's showing a normal uh, pulmonary vein flow. And you see the LA pressure fall down immediately while we clipped. It was above the aortic pressure. We saw that. And it was now 23. From 77, it was 23, which was quite a relief. Uh, we left some MR at that point in time, which I showed you. But this is the one-month picture, which shows hardly any MR. So the LV dimensions came down. LV ejection fraction improved 45%. And you see hardly any MR. This is what it is at one month. This is the four chamber view, hardly any MR. There is a jet, I agree, but this was clinically, he's asymptomatic now and feeling much, much better. So what is new in Mitra clip? The mitral FR trial, co-op trial, expand, expand G4. So briefly, I'll discuss that in interest of time. So Mitra clip helps to co-op the leaflets, restrict amyloid dilatation, helps reverse the remodeling and uh, is a great tool to improve symptomatically these patients. So Percutin, the Mitra FR was a first trial, less number of patients, only 300 randomized uh, to two groups, did not find any difference on all-cause death or hospitalization at one year. Um, there was a lot of debate and discussion. The limitations were small numbers, exclusions of a lot of patients, uh, not including patients with severe MR. They included some with mild MR also, and including some very sick patients with less than 20% EF, LV dilatation more than seven. So that's how these uh, uh, data was criticized, leading to a co-op trial, which was an American trial. Um, key inclusion was LV and systolic dimension less than 70. Um, uh, inclusion was less than 70 and moderate to severe MR at least with a functional class three to four in majority of patients, high BNP. So there were very sick patients included in this trial. All failure hospitalization to 24 months was the a major primary outcome and MR, all-cause mortality were other endpoints. So they uh, had about 665 uh, patients randomized. Um, baseline characteristics, um, I'm not going to discuss. So this is the data at two years. So a remarkable improvement uh, 
uh, in the outcome of hospitalization for heart failure. So the two patients who have completed uh, one month follow-up in our listing are asymptomatic with uh, one plus MR on echo. Both had four plus MR. So freedom for device uh, related complication, 96.6%, which makes it this procedure very, very safe. So all cause mortality also was a reduction at 24 months, very encouraging results. So the question comes uh, that uh, the quality of life is improved, mortality is improved, heart failure hospitalization is improved in this group of patients. So the patient, patient selection comes to be the very important criteria uh, in these trials. So you can see MR severity uh, definitely improved. Now we accept two plus MR as an endpoint, uh, which is also quite reasonable from four plus, if you get two plus, it's quite a reasonable endpoint. So why COP results are so different from mitral clip results? The inclusion criteria were different. Like for example, uh, uh, ER, uh, the regurgitant orifice area was more than 30 in the co-opt while it was more than 20. So that means my MR was also included. LV uh, and diastole dimensions were much higher in the mitral FR trial than the co-opt. So co-opt had a cutoff of the dimensions of the ventricle. So in March, 2019, FD expands indication for mitral therapy for secondary MR is indicated for treatment of symptomatic, moderate to severe or severe mitral regurgitation uh, uh, with MR grade three or more in patients with LVF of 20, more than 20% and less than 50% with LV and systolic dimension less than 70, whose symptoms and an MR severity persist despite maximally tolerated uh, medical therapy with S now with SGLT2 and RNA. And a multidisciplinary treatment uh, head heart team approach is always needed in these patients. So in um, uh, severe MR with suitable anatomy, uh, this procedure will be uh, stand to really be one of the important procedures. And presently available in NTR are the NTR and XTR clip. In the second patient, we have used an XTR and an NTR both. XTR is really more difficult to manipulate being a, a bigger clip. So we have COPT and MITRA FR trial as the major trials. We also, we're waiting for expand G4 trial. And guideline recommendations of MitraClip change rather rapidly with increasing data. Thank you very much, for everybody, for your hearing. Thank you, uh, Dr. Balbir, for that nice talk. I just had a few points on this MitraClip. Uh, one is, uh, well, I feel it is technically a little more difficult procedure, as you also said, but I think if you read, then probably you do it. Okay, the second point is, uh, I think age may not be as important here as the uh, condition of the patient, because the patient has uh, MR, which is significant, and LV, which is uh, in between that 20 to 50 percent, then whether he is uh, older age or he is even in an age of 50 years, I think a mitra clip could be done because if MR continues or something happens and whatever, uh, surgery may not be the right option at that time. So that is what my thought is, you can comment on that. And the third thing that I wanted to know from the technical point, if you could re-explain what is this, because I, uh, uh, what is this flail gap and what is the flail width? Can you do this? Because right. we keep talking about the flail, and why is it that only three, can you do it with 2D TOE uh, and everything? Why do you need 3D? Is it is 3D a must? Because I was told, because I was wanting to work up a case, I was told that 3D echo is a must. Right, so let's first answer the last question, is 3D a must? I think 3D is a must. You will not be able to place it uh, well. Uh, you have to have an face 3D view to actually position that clip well. There is no other way. Uh, okay. Yes, 2D, uh, 2D was being done before 3D came. Cybel has done a lot of cases on 2D, but it's going to be very, very tough because you have to position that clip right perpendicular to the two leaf lens and end face 3D view is what will give you the absolute. When you say perpendicular to the two leaf lens, like the yeah. view that you showed aorta at the top and the mitral valve orifice in the circle below yeah, right. and the two right. So you are going parallel to the two leaflets when you go in with the... Uh, no, with you're the, going... Or you're going perpendicular to the two leaflets. You get so you go perpendicular... 
So you make your position in the LA, use that same position because you will get very little chance to manipulate in the LV. LV has cordy, LV has papillary muscle. Right. Your clip okay. can get engaged there if you're moving that clip too much in the LV. So you have to rotate, do the rotation movements in the LA, make the position perpendicular right in the LA. Then position the clip at 60 degree, enter with the same position into the LV, open the clip again, reconfirm that you're perpendicular to the two leaflets in the end phase view, uh, then close it at 60 degree, see whether you've held the leaflets well or not. As I showed you at 60 degree, both the leaflets right. were held, then close the clip. So these are very important steps. So 3D is a absolute must. If 3D was not available in the country, maybe some people would have tried on 2D, but I cannot imagine how difficult I can imagine. It's going to be very tough uh, doing a procedure on 2D. Now, the second question is that uh, it can be done at all ages. Yes, but one has to remember this is a long procedure. It generally take up to uh, two to four hours and is all under general anesthesia because you're doing a deep uh, entire procedure for you're doing a team management you will have to be on ga so the general anesthesia patient has to have the general anesthesia clearance so anesthetist has to hold on to the procedure for four hours or five hours which may happen the third thing is that it is technically challenging there is no doubt about it it's much more challenging than tower procedure but the fact remains in tower you're rushing with things here you're not rushing with things you have time to think because you are not Hemodynamically compromising the patient. So you, have, so you have to, you have that time to think, redo, open the clip if you're not happy, go back again. I did three times in this patient. In the second time, in the second patient, we did five times. So you have chance to go back again. You have a chance to get another clip. Tower doesn't give you that many chances. So this is the advantage you have with this procedure, but it is definitely technically more challenging than that. So uh, can I ask, yeah. can I so what is flail gap and flail width? Uh, okay. The last one. So this um, flail gap and flail leaflet. So gap is seen where they don't join. So that is the gap. The width okay. is the leaflet. How much leaflet height is flail? So you calculate distance. So gap is the width and uh, the uh, the flail width is the length of the leaflet, which is flail. How much leaflet? So if it is more than 8 millimeter uh, flail, uh, you will have a tough time getting hold of that. What do the guidelines say, Balbir, now age is not at all? Because we do yeah, see a so lot of younger patients, like 45 year, 50 year dilated cardiopathies, non-ischemic with severe MRs. Uh, do you feel they could benefit by this? People say that LVs regress and uh, pressure yeah, significantly definitely. Definitely, it will improve. The guidelines, uh, do they have anything on that point? So, guidelines, I showed you the 2019 guidelines. Clearly mentioned secondary mitral regurgitation. Now, this becoming a procedure of choice in many patients. So, earlier, the STS score and operability was a big, big issue. It's not anymore now. So, the guidelines are favoring uh, secondary MR, uh, functional MR as a very important indication for. And uh, the, the kind of improvement that we saw at one month in these two patients was really phenomenal actually what i would say is that if you feel that the patient's uh, longevity will not be compromised as much by his ejection fraction and mr is contributing to his uh, worsening i think a procedure should be done if you have a patient who has a lv of 15 percent uh, he would otherwise die because of that 15 percent then maybe it may not be helpful but if you have a patient with 35% and some moderate MR or moderate to severe MR, I think that is the patient who should be done irrespective of age. This I can only say from my uh, wisdom of the clinical cardiology. Sorry, sir. Yeah, so I, I, I totally agree, sir. It was an excellent presentation, sir. Great presentation. And I agree. Uh, in fact, the very first case which I did has completed one and a half year. And I'm going to come to that point which P.K. Goyal, sir, pointed out about ejection fraction. What what the studies have shown and our small experience tells us LV internal dimensions. So if you look at the 70 mm, so if you have a LV which is bigger than 70 mm, it's more like a globular and those patients might not regress. But the most important thing we should also evaluate is the RV function. 
Now, sometimes these patients with severe MR and dilated cardiomyopathy might have poor RV function. These patients will not do better. But uh, age, age for a functional MR, I would suggest that age is uh, age yeah. should not be into a consideration Hello, because nobody is going to operate a functional MR. And that is why you see the yeah. trial patients. Uh, I don't remember the name of the trial, but patients who are on the heart transplant list after getting a mitra clip, they were off listed, and they did not require any heart transplant. So I think case selection is very important. Regarding the technicality, it's a very safe procedure because you are on the vein side, you are on the venous side, you are working in the LA, you are not even on the LV side, patient is not being hemodynamic compromised. Uh, it takes time and I think proper understanding of T is very important uh, to complete the procedure. The only way a complication can happen is if your clip embolizes or you can tear a leaflet. Now, the 3D TE is must serve. The only way to get a perpendicularity on a 2D TE is somebody ah, who is expert in getting a transgastric view. So, if you get a transgastric view, only on a transgastric ah, view, you can make an emphasis of the mitral valve. But 3D TE is must serve. Uh, uh, regarding that, the boys are comment about play width and play length. These are all the criteria that was utilized in Everest 2 trial. Yes. Uh, reverse to trial, uh, yeah, the, why the trial failed is an uh, important point. They, irrespective of the risk of the patient, they include all patients with primary MR. Trial gap is, uh, if in, in a short axis transgastric view, how much is the distance between the medial and lateral side of the leaf, particular uh, particular P3 segment or P1, uh, P1 uh, scallop? Uh, file uh, width is the length, uh, uh, the, uh, the length at which uh, the PML is away from the AML. They initially took 10 millimeter and 15 millimeter. Nowadays, uh, the, surgeon, the patient feels, the surgeon or the operator feels that the particular patient is high risk. Uh, uh, the, those criteria are not being considered for uh, primary MR clipping. Those criteria are not mandatory for secondary MR. Those are only for primary MR. For secondary MR, it is whatever Dr. Ravinder told. Uh, LV internal dimension, RB should be fine, RB function should be, PA should not be severe. Most important criteria is the three subset of T groups in uh, for trial. T1, T2, and T3. T1 is the EROA more than 0.4. T2 is the EROA less than 0.4, but more than 0.3. Those subset of patients can also be included, provided we have uh, other criteria like pulmonary venous flow reversal, uh, vena contractors, uh, then uh, uh, regular volume more than 45 mils. Uh, irrespective of the patients falling into T2, T3, or T1, co-op clearly showed that beneficial effect was seen in, in all the three tier groups. Can I ask a question to Balbir sir and all the experts? You know, sometimes you would see in our patients, you know, in the OPD, a patient has severe MR and then uh, uh, we called him for a follow-up at one month uh, to evaluate for mitral clip and now the MR is mild. Does anybody do a stress uh, echo or maybe increase the blood pressure as an OPD basis to evaluate the MR, Bhupati, uh, sir? Well, and that's then... a very, very important question. I may answer that. In yeah. co-op trial, <laughs> co trial was very, very stringently done. Trial. That was the reason why it was successful. Every third patient was excluded yes. after GDMT. If you look at the co-op trial, RNA was replaced only in 4 or 5 percent. AC inhibitors were more than 90 percent. The patient has to be on those drugs. One third of the patient, the grade 3 MR becomes grade 1 or 2. And the, if it is grade 2 or 1, they, they exclude those patients. So GDMT really works in, uh, in 3 or 4 MR. It drops down the MR by at least 1 or 2 grade uh, if the patient uh, is on appropriate dosage. So though, that is the plus point about uh, co-op trial. Those such a stringent criteria were not utilized in mitral for That's another reason why the particular mitral for file. Stress test to evaluate MR, sir. Anybody, uh, Bhupati, sir, and anybody does there in a practice? It's not know. been studied. Uh, the, so I don't have any experience with stress, uh, stress test related MR. Uh, but, but you know, we used to do ask the patient to do exercise. If the patient has got some amount of MR uh, to assess the pH function, a uh, pH pressure in cath lab. That is a different story, but uh, definitely stress will increase MR. Uh, that's the terminology what they use called as a eclipsing MR. Uh, during specific ex exertion or specific activities, the MR comes and goes. There are reported case series where eclipse MR was clipped or patient went for surgical. Uh, sir, we are running late by 10 minutes. Shall, uh, we, shall we stop uh, here and move to the next session?
Yeah, thank you, Naveen, for the opportunity. And uh, we had good discussion both on important aspects. Over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Balbi. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Thank, thank you, you so uh, Dr. Goyal, Dr. Srinivas, Dr. Bhupati, Dr. Uh, Manik, <clears throat> and uh, Dr. Ankur. So uh, the nice discussion, nice, uh, uh, you know, the session. Now we are going to move to the next session that is on uh, imaging, role of imaging in cardiology and over to Dr. Devender for further proceedings. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, in the next session for next 40 minutes, we will be discussing on imaging, uh, especially on OCT. And there will be two speaker and the uh, chairperson for the session are Dr. Viveka Kumar and Dr. Amitabh Yajdevanshi. Uh, Dr. Viveka Kumar is Principal Director and Chief of Cath Lab at Max Hospital Saket. He has more than 20 years of experience in cardiology with extensive experience in various cardiac intervention and electrophysiological procedures, uh, including complex multivessel bifurcation and left main angioplasty, uh, even in calcified vessels and in various imaging procedures, including FFR, OCT. And uh, he has many academic and professional excellence awards including International Award of Excellence in Cardiology from St. George Hospital, London, Lifetime Achievement Award by Gastric Society of India, Chikitsa Ratna Award, Vidya Ratna Award, and many more. He has more than 50 publications in uh, various rep international reputed journals, and he has been the investigator and participator in various trials. And uh, our second chairperson for the session will be Dr. Amitabh Yadivanshi. Uh, he is Unit Director, Intervention Cardiology at PSRI Hospital, Delhi. And uh, he's has more than 17 years of experience, specialized in the various complex cardiac intervention procedures, and uh, also uh, in electrophysiological procedures and various device implantation. And again, he has various national and international publications. His innovative work on renal denervation therapy uh, of resistant hypertension also is there. And he has uh, done various ECMO procedures also. So for the next 40 minutes, I hand over the session for Dr. Amitabh Edwanshi uh, for moderating the session. It's over to you, sir. Audio, audio muted. So you are mute. Uh, sir, your uh, audio is mute. Yeah, yeah. can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. good morning. Sir. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, everybody. And it's indeed a pleasure to uh, have this conference and uh, congratulations, Naveen, for this wonderful conference. Uh, I am unfortunately at Srinagar and the internet connection is uh, quite uh, dicey here. So uh, can I request uh, Naveen to uh, present the slides uh, of the uh, speakers, uh, the introductory slides, or uh, do you have them? So uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Praveer Agrawal. Yeah, yeah, so I just wanted to introduce them. So I don't have those slides right now because I am on my phone. So just give me a second. I will just, uh, just yeah. yeah so. So, so Dr. Praveer Agrawal, I believe uh, needs no introduction. He is the director of inter interventional cardiology. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, Amitabh. Yes, yeah. Dr. Amitabh. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Dr. Praveer uh, is director of interventional cardiology at Fortis Escorts and. Uh, he is an alumni of uh, KGMC Lucknow and did his DM from uh, Kanpur. And uh, he uh, had more than 25 years of experience in interventional cardiology and has done more than 1100 uh, angioplasties, does, does more than 1100 angioplasties annually. And he's master of uh, complex uh, calcified interventions. We all know that. And he has been guest to various national and international con congresses. And uh, he has trained more than 100 uh, interventional cardiologists who are doing great work across the country. So welcome, Dr. Praveer, uh, for this meeting. Uh, our next uh, uh, speaker would be uh, Dr. Mantri. Dr. Mantri is director of Cath Lab and, uh, at uh, Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. And he is also uh, uh, keenly interested in complex coronary interventions and multivessel PTCA. Uh, which includes rotablation, TTO interventions, and uh, various uh, imaging modalities. He's an expert in device closure for various types of congenital heart disease and pacemaker implantations. And he has more than 50 uh, publications to his credit, both in national and international general. So uh, welcome, Dr. Mantri. Uh, the next uh, will be Dr. Devender Agarwal. He's our panelist, and he, he again is the principal consultant at the uh, 
uh, Max Hospital, Shalmar Bagh, and he has more than 13 years of experience. He has keen interest in imaging and complex angioplasties. He has published uh, in national and international journals and uh, has, has abstracts that have been submitted and accepted in, at various conferences nationally and internationally. The uh, so welcome, Dr. Devender. Uh, I, I would also like to introduce Dr. Samir Kubba. Uh, he is an associate director at, uh, at Max Hospital uh, Vaishali, Ghaziabad. And uh, he has done his DM from PGI uh, Chandigarh. He has more than 15 years of experience and is proficient in ha handling all kinds of cardiac emergencies. He has been instrumental in establishing the primary healthcare pro primary angioplasty pro program at Gurgaon uh, at the Artemis Health Institute, and he has uh, numerous research papers and publications in his name. And he has been awarded with the most educational case at PCI, uh, on PCI uh, at the Asia PCR Sing Singapore Live 2012 conference, and also the best case award. Uh, at Interventional Cardiology Conference at Washington DC in 2014. So welcome, Dr. Samir. And uh, the next person I would like to welcome is Dr. Preeti Sharma, uh, is a uh, old, old friend of mine, uh, Associate Director and Head of Department of Cardiac Sciences at uh, Dehradun. Uh, Dr. Preeti has over 13 years of experience in, his, in her field of Interventional Cardiology. And her area of special interest includes complex coronary interventions, bifurcations, left main, and CTOs. Again, she also has various publications in national and international journals, as worked as an investigator in the Everest trial, Women's Achiever Award for Excellence in Cardiac Interventions in 2017, Health Action Award of Science of India 2016, National Faculty for Life in India Life Conference. In, International Associate Fellow of American College of Cardiology. So, welcome, Dr. Pinky. And uh, with that, uh, I would request uh, the first uh, speaker to uh, start his uh, celebration. Thank you. Uh, with due permission, Viveka. Yeah. Um, can we start? So yeah, welcome to Dr. Pravir Agrawal. So he'll be, you. you know, speaking on how relevant the OCT is, is just the hype or the reality is that, you know, this adds a lot of, you know, dimensions and help in our complex intervention. So Dr. Pravir will be doing the justice to this, no better person than him who can, you know, see the role of OCT in complex PCIs. So Dr. Pravir, please share your slides and go ahead. Yeah, are my slides visible? Can you see yes, my slides, please? Yes, yes you can see that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's uh, like a debatable thing. It's a hype or necessity. So Naveen has uh, put me into a great uh, point that whether I'm like uh, what kind of like message I give in the end. But I tell you the truth about this OCT, which is to me initially it was looking maybe a hype, but now we realize it is becoming a necessity. Now to just see. For an experience, IVAS uses it because all of us have been use, using IVAS a long time. OCT offers an exponential increase in resolution, speed, and accuracy that we all know. It's a superior resolution, almost 10 times better than IVAS, and maybe it's a superior pre and post images. And uh, not a rocket science, you can have some experience and you can, you can just do it very, very easily. The speed is tremendous. You can take about 36 millimeters per second. Robust clinical evidence. Like we are not talking uh, without evidence. Like it's a CLI, OPCI, and CLI OPCI 2, Opus class, Illumin 1, 2, and 3, and the future trials are Illumin 4, and other areas of concentration are complex procedures, BVS, and ACI. So let's see in the detail of it. OCT uh, is a registry of OCT for OCT, CLI OPCI. That showed clearly at one year of follow up, if you're using OCT images during PCI, you are having better outcomes in the term of cardiac death, MI, and repeat revas. The numbers are not great, but still, it, it is really a, like a significant, about 15.1% uh, as compared to 9.6%. Like you can have really, uh, not a great difference, but still the trends are really good. So they showed clearly that if you're using the device, you are 
like benefiting the patient. Illumin 1. That showed that the significant uh, reduction in mace at one year due to detecting 32% malapposition, 32% edge detection, 10-27% under expansion, which is uh, in, in contrast to optimally uh, like successful angiographic guided PCI. So it's a significant number if you compare with optimally like uh, a successful angiographic PCI. Element two, that again showed the mace rate with these was less because of more detection of malapposition and dissections than IVA. But if you see a sense expense, it was similar. Element three, that clearly showed superior to IVA's guided PCI at detecting certain predictors like of major cardiac events. One is major dissection, second is malapposition. So these are the two factors which ultimately lead to the MACE at maybe uh, sometime, maybe one year or two years later. Again showed, if you just compare with the angiographic guidance, it's a significant better expansion of this thing if you just uh, compare with the like uh, routine angiography for that. Third thing is that if you just see the IVAS versus the uh, like OCT in the recent expansion, they are similar in both. Life Lab Clinical Research Initiative is a, is a long, long experience with them. They say in about say pre and post procedure, if you are doing an like OCT, you are changing your like some or other uh, point of like uh, interest, maybe the pre-morphology length diameter post dissections, a position expansion about majority of patients. I would not name the number, number looks huge. Eye optical study again, it's a South Asian study. And they, they determined that the pre-PCI is totally change involved need for lesion preparation, change in the intended center length size and intended device landing zone. And post-PCI, you can look at the like extent malapositions as dissections and extent under expansion. So both the, both are, all these factors were considered and not to our surprise, the variables analyzed were lesion preparation, intended stent length, intended stent diameter, intended stenting strategy and landing zone. And just see in majority of patients there were minor or major modifications, almost 90% of patients. So to me, it looks like it's a, it's a good device. Now let us hear some examples. This is a 68 years old gentleman, like who comes with the instant resnosis. Like uh, this thing was placed a couple of years back, maybe about eight or ten years back. He comes with uh, like a good angina, and after the initial uh, two minutes of balloon dilatation, then OCT then was taken. Now see this plaque. This plaque is fibrotic and calcific. Like if you see the whole area, the arc of calcium is more than 300 degrees. Microns is about 700. So if you don't modify these plaques the stent expansion within a stent becomes really difficult. So after seeing this one, initially we're not intending to do that one road we are planning initially just take a cutting balloon down as usually we do in a, like a, a instant resources and put the stent and come out. So it's a gentle and uh, with a 1.5 bar good drilling, taking about say four or five minutes of drilling time so that good heat is delivered and the plaque is modified. And still you're not leaving there, then take a like a just balloon down for a like diagonal which was closing off and then take an optimal size cutting balloon. Right, and make a good lumen there. And then take a 2.75 as the rectal size, take a 2.75 stent, deploy it at normal pressure, then go with a high pressure balloon with the same diameter 2.75, and see the OCT run. The stent looks well opposed, well open. If you see the like area, it's, uh, it's fine at proximal distal edges, but in the middle of that, the area looks a bit smaller than what at, at the edges. But the stent looks well expanded. You don't see any areas of uh, like malaposition or like that, but still you want to improve on that. You see this area in the, in the center, like the, it looks like slightly uh, less done. So after doing in this OCT run, we took an 0.25 oversized balloon and did it nominal pressure, maybe slightly higher pressure, and that's a reasonable result in this kind of like a bad trees. We know that all these lesions with the re-snosis, they come back very, very soon. If you don't do a good job, like uh, at the like second setting that you got a chance. Now see this lady, this lady comes with left main disease with the, the osteophility uh, disease. Previously she had an angioplasty to mid LED and, and the circumflex about the, uh, like six or eight years back, she's doing all right. And now this is a lesion, this is a bad lesion but the sarcosium is fine. And it's a fibrotic plaque that we know initially. So we took the initial like uh, run with the OCT. 
uh, sorry, with the eye work, we just see the morphology. So in eye work, what we saw is that uh, the diameter of the proximal LED is about 3.75, and the left main is measuring around 5.5 or maybe 5.6. So the great discrepancy in the size of the distal LED, proximal LED, and that distal left main. So I think I was and I was also showed it is a fibrotic lesion. It's not a very uh, like uh, bad calcium there. So we just did a 2.5 balloon to just make a room there, and just to take a 3.5 cutting balloon at a nominal pressure to just cut the plaque as usual because the osseal lesions behave badly if you don't uh, cut them up. And then it's a 4-0 stent. Let's go to the next one. Deployed at nominal pressure, reasonable opening. Then this opposed the little channel because proximally the vessel was looking 5.5, 5.6. So this was about a five meter balloon, a short balloon. Uh, did about uh, reasonably high pressure, about 18 atmospheres. And see this, what happens? I see this area in the LED looks a bit hazy here. Instead, it's still approximately not uh, like up to the like mark, and the stent we took can go up to what 5.7. So sarcosm is looking fine. So we just did an OT OTT run to just see why this haziness is appearing. Now see this image. The distal stent, which is doing reasonably well, well deployed, not much of in group. It double, there's a small, uh, you can see that section, but it's uh, not really well compromising. And now there's a this uh, stent, this stent that we've used from distal left main to distal LED to proximal, uh, sorry, distal, the proximal LED to left main. Now see the proximal stuck. You can clearly see here the stents are underexpanded. Despite we doing a like five balloon till this point, but to our surprise, with a five millimeter balloon at say maybe about sixteen or eighteen atmospheres, the stent has broken across the circumflex ostium. That's how you're seeing that haziness which we're looking on on, on the angiogram. You seeing this picture? And you see the struts are slightly more open than what they should be. And the proximal edge is not deployed, as you can see it's here also. And you see this, the struts are broken there. They are hanging. See the next picture. The same thing in. Zoom view, you can see that all struts have broken. There's no integrity of the stent at this place, but still is holding on. We knew the proximal the stent is not very well deployed. It's not opposed because the arteries there is 5.7 and we have already gone, done only five. But seeing this uh, like uh, architectural damage to the stent, we did not dare to go up with the stent with the, with the like balloon again. And let me show you the last angiographic picture. It is looking reasonable. So though it is looking like properly underdone, but still, this was done in January and we left it because this was still around say maybe 4.75 or maybe nearly close to like 4.9 at proximal edge. So we left it there and till now she's doing fine. But supposing the OCT was not there, I would have gone easily with a 5.5 balloon at the proximal edge because the stand will take about say 5.7. So I did not do it seeing that the surf is also doing fine. The lady clinically is doing fine. I saw last month, she's doing all right. So I left it there. Now see this patient. Uh, let me just go, yeah. It's a lesion in the yeah, young, about 47 years old, and all these are diabetics have got fibrotic lesions. So the OCT is on. Initially it would look like just, just go with the balloon and, and uh, just come out to this end. The OCT is unsure. The lesion is mainly fibrotic. And there's some calcium also sitting here, and the fibrosis is good. It's a good fibrotic lesion. If you don't prepare the bed well, the lesion is not going to give way, and you will have an like, uh, under result with your stent. 
now it's a regular balloon and then it, now the pressure size is coming 2.75 the 2.75 cutting balloon at about say 14 or 16 atmospheres to cut it all around after doing that 2.75 2610 as defined by the oct deployed at reasonable pressures normal pressures and again a 2.75 balloon at high pressure which is around 18 or 21 but the same size and see the oct run this thing look well deployed no doubt about it but see these areas this is near the proximal edge you can see hardly any struts covering the lesion here you can see the struts they are very well defined here you can see the struts they are very well defined but in the center of like in the near the proximal edge you can see here also the struts are like widely apart and they are not as close as it in the normal architecture of the stem here the stem has gone elongated when we measure it the stem was placed but 2.75 and 26 now this has become nearly close to 229 or 29.5 close to 30 mm so the stem has got proximal stretching without any undue pressure on the stem and this has happened this all is a fiber optic lesion and we see often see if you oversize the balloon you can do that but this is a nominal size balloon 2.75 versus 2.75 so you are concerned that this proximal led is one thing that you don't want to just uh, leave it like that but still we took a picture picture is looking reasonable you can see some area is now 116 oct it looks slightly more maybe hazy just as, as, as just as a thought but we left it there and this was done in october 2020 the patient still doing fine so what the clinical significance significance of this finding i'm not sure but still uh it is to be noticed that the stent got elongated in the proximal segment and this clearly shown on the oct the length which was in why we noticed that is the stent placement was here and we could see the stent is coming to elastium we said look we cannot place the stent at elastium why is seeing this stent at elastium so that was the reason that the stent got elongated from 26 to 29.5 now see this is a like lesion which is now the like again uh, the bio abdol is pulled as some in picture and we know that angiographically or by maybe maybe an iwas you can't see much of these scap folds in uh, today's life so it's a regular balloon dilatation and now the oct run to see the fibrotic lesion see this fibrotic lesion they are all diabetic patients with a strong family history and these lesions are really bad to dilate very very bad to dilate if you don't prepare them well they look look simple but they are not now see it's a, uh, like 2.5 cutting balloon at high pressure high pressure means about 16 or 18 atmospheres to make a good room there at the 2.75 is capable because it comes in minimum is 2.75 deployed at nominal pressures now it's a tape same 2.75 balloon at high pressures about say 23 or 25 atmospheres and an oct run you can see the scaffold is very well deployed i'll show you the running picture so that will show you the scaffold is very well deployed but if we just compare the mla in the center is looking less than what it should be the proximal edge is fine and the distal edge is fine despite being the deployment is looking reasonable on oct we just went a quarter size up clean out of balloon at high pressure and the end result is looking very very gratifying this is a different view it looks nice So it's a very well deployed stent, and the, for a scaffold, the high pressures are about 20 to 25, not 17 or 18. Now see this one again, the same patient with RCA, which again we will behave in the same way. And see the fibrosis. This is gross fibrosis surrounding area. See this whole area. Again, the same strategy. Put a cutting balloon of nominal size because we open to 2.5. We'll use the same balloon, and a 3O scaffold here, and then 3O dilatation. And just see the OCT run. The stent is looking very well deployed, and you see these stents are looking so beautiful. These boxes. Here and there, you can see mild malaposition, mild, very very minimal. So with the with this uh, scaffold, there's a four quarter size over balloon which is already provided with that. 
So after doing this, we just took a three of uh, three point two five balloon and get went hyper at the same result of that. So to summarize, OCT has become an important adjunct to the present day PCI procedures due to high resolution and short learning curve. If one has time and finance, it can be used in majority of patients to improve upon your PCI results. If one is in trouble, it can provide useful information to resolve the problem. And to me, it is mandatory and jump to BVS therapy for adequate bed preparation and stent expansion. Thank you. Thanks for attention. Thank you, Dr. Pravi, for a nice lecture on this issue. And I think uh, at the end of the second talk, probably we'll have the question answer. Is that right? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so I think, uh, Amitabh, if you allow, we can go to the next talk. Dr. Mantri will be speaking on intracoronary imaging in acute coronary syndrome. So I think there's a lot of things to learn in and the insight which is given by OCT, which I'm sure Dr. Mantri is going to highlight that. So over to Dr. Mantri for his talk on this topic. Uh, thank you, Praveer. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you, Naveen, for inviting for this talk. Now, I am in a remote town in Rajasthan where electricity and internet both are uh, unpredictable. So I will try to present, you, finish. You have, you have the OCT there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have OCT slides. So I will be discussing few cases, uh, uh, some theoretical discussion and few cases about OCT and acute coronary syndrome. So, my slides are not going, how to move them. Can somebody help me in moving the slides, please? Slides are not moving. What should I do? Hello. Can I just enter? Any... Just enter. I think you can go back and before reload, uh, before loading, you have to enable the content and then. Okay, start. I will stop sharing and then I mm. will share again. Maybe. No, no, first, first write uh, that click the button, enable the content and then start. Where, where should I click? Uh, when you open the PowerPoint on the top, there may be. Yeah. Share. Yeah. yeah. Now share it again. Okay, okay. So let me come to it. Okay. So OCT in acute coronary syndrome, it helps in determining etiology. So before uh, OCT, we were reliant on largely angiography, and then there were IVAS. But after OCT, we had clear understanding that majority of MI are due to three phenomena. Either it is plaque erosion, plaque rupture, or calcific nodule. Rarely, there are other things uh, like uh, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. It also helped in choosing the correct size and length, as has been highlighted by Praveer. It also helps in optimizing PCI result and so on. So uh, the basic uh, difference is between uh, plaque erosion and plaque rupture. So majority of patients uh, with conventional risk factor are with plaque rupture, 60 to 70%. Plaque erosion is seen in 20 to 25%. Now, patients with plaque erosion do not usually do not fit in conventional risk factor. Most of them are young, maybe women, maybe smoker. And plaque rupture, majority of them will present with ST elevation MI, erosion, non ST elevation MI. In plaque rupture, uh, rupture cases, they are chronic atherosclerosis. So there is positive vessel remodeling, what we call is global phenomena. And this is, there is no, Plaque erosion, there is no diffuse and chronic atherosclerosis. So there may be, there is no remodeling or rather negative remodeling. Uh, plaque rupture is lipid rich, thin cap fibroatheroma. They are fibrotic, no, no necrotic core and intact intima in plaque erosion. And majority of thrombus is, uh, main content of thrombus is red in plaque rupture, white in plaque thrombosis. And this is the pathophysiology of uh, plaque erosion because of shear forces and 
deleterious effect on endothelium. There is denudation of endothelial layer. And the present technology can't see whether the endothelium is intact or not. So we call uh, the fibrous cape is intact or not. And uh, these are the OCT pictures of some of the cases, how the plaque erosion may look like. And this one study was uh, done in a large number of patients of OCS, uh, six, uh, five, seven centers were from Japan, three from US, one from Europe, and they have found that these are the mechanisms given. So in ST elevation MI, uh, majority were plaque rupture, but there were significant number of plaque erosion. And non-ST elevation MI, uh, plaque erosion was more in number. And they have... Uh, Certified certain uh, uh, investigated certain criteria that is younger patient means less uh, chances of chronic atherosclerosis. Anterior ischemia basically hereditary. So since plaque erosion is related to endothelial denudation, it has been found that the artery which more branches have more chances of plaque erosion at the side of branching. Now, these patients are usually non-diabetic. They have normal kidney function. And important, no anemia. So it has been found that patients who have high hemoglobin, that is more than 15, are uh, having probably more viscous blood and more chances of plaque erosion. And when all five parameters were present in this study, plaque erosion was seen in 73.5% of cases. This is, uh, this is a plaque rupture. This is a wrong level. So in plaque rupture, there is presence of fibrous case dis discontinuity. There is communication between lumen and inner core, inner core of plaque or cavity formation in the plaque. And it is usually lipid rich plaque, thin cap, fibroatheroma, and necrotic core. Now in plaque erosion, there is attached thrombus overlying an intact or visualized plaque. Or there may be luminal surface irregularity uh, and nothing else at the culprit lesion, and there is no thrombus if the patient is uh, uh, investigated late. Or if there is large amount of thrombus is present and uh, you can't see the fibrous cape or underlying plaque because of this thrombus, then the criteria is that immediate, within immediate proximity of this, uh, there is either no calcium or no uh, lipid-rich uh, plaque. So these are the criteria to diagnose plaque erosion. And these are the certain uh, uh, frames of plaque erosion. Here you can see it is dominantly thrombus, but you can see intact edema. Again, plaque with just uh, uh, attached thrombus. Uh, most of the pictures show similar. There is plaque, intact uh, uh, these uh, layers, intact this uh, anti uh, uh, fibrous cape, and there is just some attached thrombus. Calcific nodule is usually seen in elderly patient with CKD, torturous vessel, heavily calcified, and intimal rupture and protrusion of calcium into the lumen. And this is typically uh, the, how the patient presents as calcific nodule. This calcific nodule erodes into the lumen of the vessel, and there is uh, uh, er eroding of the uh, fibrous cape, and this leads to thrombus formation. Then uh, the, uh, three things were uh, combined in this study together, published recently, that is near infrared spectroscopy to look at the amount of uh, lipid, IVAS, and OCT. And they have come out with certain criteria that in plaque rupture, the, within four millimeter segment, there is a lot of lipid. And there is a, a communication between intima and the uh, media. Then in plaque erosion, you don't see uh, much of cholesterol, very small amount of lipid, predominantly thrombus. And in calcific nodule, uh, again, uh, the uh, lipid uh, amount is very small and it is predominantly calcific lesion. And these are the criteria they have given. Uh, so if there is one calcium, if it is present, it is calcific nodule. For other, they have given based on uh, evidence of definite plaque structure or probable plaque structure based on lipid content of the uh, at the lesion site. And we all know about erosion study which was published in 2017 and it started the debate whether all patients 
to present with SCA should undergo stent implantation or not. This was a small study of 60 patients, but the uh, majority of them, 92% roughly, were uh, free of symptoms, just managed on medical therapy alone, if the underlying mechanism was block erosion. So just I will uh, quickly go to three of my cases. Case one is a 30-year-old male, history of uh, acute uh, MI. This is the ECG at presentation and before the study. Managed, initially managed with LMWH and DAPT and then taken up for angiography. And you can see there is filling defect in the proximal LED. So uh, even in absence of OCT, probably most of us would have treated this case conservatively because there is no flow limiting reason. But OCT has given us better understanding. So this is the OCT picture. And uh, initially, you see a side branch with thrombus, then there is predominant white thrombus. And most of the vessel is normal. And these are the OCT segmental analysis. So you can see this was block erosion. We left this patient on medical therapy. Follow up after two months, patient remained asymptomatic. These are the angiographic pictures. So no visible intraluminal filling defect. And this is the OCT run. Uh, now the surface looks very smooth. There is thick fibrous cape. The side branch ostium which contains thrombus, all thrombus has dissipated practically, and smooth lumen. There is, of course, some non uh, atheroma which is not lumen compromising. And these are the comparative pictures. So initially, there was thrombus at the site of side branch, no thrombus now. And similarly, where there was marked thrombus, uh, there is reduction in the lumen, uh, increase in the lumen area from the previous. Case two is a 62 year male diabetic hypertensive post pacemaker admitted with uh, after 15 days with history of chest pain. ECG was inconclusive due to pace rhythm. Pro pi was grossly elevated. Echo showed ball motion with EF of 48. Uh, you can say just uh, about 50% plaque, but let us see what the OCT reveals us. So this was the OCT picture of this patient, and you can see a ruptured plaque communicating with the cavity. So this was the case of plaque rupture, and here, you can see this OCT picture and that this is a cap of fibroetheroma which clearly is ruptured and there is communication with media. So here the clear decision was to stand this patient. Okay, So thank you, Dr. Mantri, for nice lecture. So do we have any questions from the panelists? Can we ask? So, uh, can I make a short comment over here, sir? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, definitely, uh, OCT is something which if we have with us, uh, we must use it. But what are the absolute uh, conditions wherein you cannot do without it? I mean, we don't have the luxury at all times. All centers do not have it. And sometimes you have to make it available before the case. So uh, Dr. Mantri, uh, Dr. Viveka, Dr. Praveet, what, what would be the, uh, I would say, class one sort of uh, practical indications where you just cannot do without imaging? Yeah, Dr. Praveen, would you like to answer that? Uh, 
do we have dr praveer so dr praveer has left i think for some okay. other commitment okay, okay. Uh, doc, doc, yeah dr mantri please go ahead no better person than oh, you it is uh, so i i don't think uh, how the communication was lost lost case was very interesting it was spontaneous coronary artery dissection which was presented in acute summary and managed uh, uh, conservatively based on oct because it was just uh, sped and two month we have two month oct also where there was a near total ali so the absolute indication is in the stent stenosis but to understand the mechanism and decide the type of therapy you are going to use then in acute coronary syndrome as we have discussed especially patient who are younger who do not have conventional risk factor then we can by using oct we can leave this patient just on medical therapy and without putting a, a stent and the third is of course ambiguous looking lesion after putting the stent or some ambiguity in the artery so that to, if you want to see the lumen oct is the best strategy okay what about left main I mean, would, would you would you always uh, do an imaging in a left main or you can do it without it if available we should always image left main but i know we have many centers where there is no imaging facility available and patient present with acute coronary syndrome so there they are fully just justified in doing the left main intervention even without using the imaging facility there is one question in the chat box from dr rahul he wants to know that in acute coronary syndrome even thrombosuction is not a level indication now so should we do uh, oct in these cases i think he is mistook with acs and acute st elevation mi so i think uh, dr mantri would you like to answer his question yes uh, uh, acute coronary uh, syndrome uh, now we have st elevation mi non st elevation mi in st elevation mi the first priority is to establish the flow by whatever method you want to do so first is to establish flow and then if the finances and time permits after you can still do especially if the patient is young and there are no conventional risk factor especially young smoker we should do oct and find out what is the underlying pathology and if it is plaque erosion and patient is hemodynamically and electrically stable then oct has a role definitely otherwise most of these young patient will end up getting a stent yeah so dr priti i think uh, she she would like to say something on the role of uh, you know oct uh, in complex so these these are the situations like stent failure restenosis left main so there are certain situations where must be using you know imaging technique we it oct or i was so any comment dr priti on on where one should use must use rather uh, oct kind of imaging stent failure it is a must that we should image uh, these lesions before we try and fix it because sometimes there are surprises for you and uh, this is one indication i would recommend uh, we should all try to image these lesions and number 2 is young patients in whom after thrombosuction we feel that the lesion is uh, uh, borderline and uh, we want to leave these lesions so you you should be confident about the uh, morphology of the lesion and about the area stenosis before you take a decision so i think and the left main definitely so these three in my lab are the indications where we try to use imaging in most of our patients yeah so i think our co panelist dr ajay agrawal has not said anything let him dr ajay would you like to say something on imaging necessity of OCT where you would not like to use course, IVS. Uh, yes, yes. Of course, the the as the Dr. Pitti has said, uh, it's the stent failure, the stent restenosis is the prime indication for doing the OCT. I, I want to ask a question that what are the confidence markers where in case of acute MI when you do thrombosuction and you see uh, lesion is not significant, what criteria should be followed? Uh, for putting patient on medications in spite of uh, instead of putting stent so the yeah, answer, is, answer is look at the vessel wall 
if there is no if it is pitting and plaque erosion or sub uh, uh, that is spontaneous coronary artery dissection if these two criteria are met and the patient is hemodynamically and electrically stable that is the time we can leave this patient on medical therapy but as dr priti has said you should be very confident to leave them on medical therapy that's why imaging is uh, of a great help if you want to decide that okay i want to leave this patient on medical therapy dr manjeet i may sir ask, in that uh, one more question uh, in if i may ask one, like, one, one more question one, in continuation of that once you have done a combo section once you have done a combo section then uh, how how confident will you be in leaving the vessel because well, you know that combo section device is such a bulky uh, device so there would be a lot of bleeding work if you have done combo so in an acute mi where you have a lot of combos uh, i would really be very uh, skeptical in leaving the vessel uh, even if there is no obvious uh, section uh, visible once i have done a combo So, so to answer that, the first study which was presented, eleven center, six countries, eleven uh, country uh, study of uh, nearly twelve hundred patients, they did thrombosuction in every patient, okay. and then they did imaging, and once they find that there is only thrombus, because you don't have to see the lesion, also you can get a good picture. by seeing the adjoining areas also if the vessel otherwise is totally healthy all around there is a diagnostic diagnostic that uh, you know the patient should have done this better then patient can perform surgery yeah so i think uh, in the interest of time we will have to wind it up and we must thank all the speakers all the panelists and the chairpersons for wonderful contribution so over to dr navin bhamri to take the session for the dr bhamri thank you thank you dr viveka thank you dr mitab uh, dr pravi and dr mantri for sparing your uh, precious time and i would like to thank uh, dr samir dr preeti and dr ajay agarwal for conducting this session and now uh, we should move to session 3 that is case in the box live and over to dr sudhanshu for this session uh good afternoon everybody and welcome to the next session of our uh, icc conference that is to, uh, 2021 and uh, that is a case in the life in the case that is presented by a uh, team of doctors at the max salimar uh, hospital and i would like to for this session i like to introduce our chair persons first of all uh, professor dr sanjay tyagi he is an uh, doctor professor in the gv panth hospital he is an eminent and leading international cardiologist and academician having the more than 30 years of experience he is in pioneer in inspiring and nurturing several generation of cardiologists in the past and present he is holding various position like uh, he has been the vice president of cardiology society of india he has been to the dghs to the ministry of health and the family welfare delhi government and he was also the dean of the molana medical college that is mamsi and uh, also the director of the gv panth hospital he has been conferred various national honors like uh, bc ro awards by the president of india lifetime achievement awards by the delhi branch of cardiology society of india and dr sure. r radhakrishnas memorial national teachers award 2014 he has done extensive work in the coronary valvular peripheral intervention specially takasu arthritis having the innumerable publications in national and international journals like jack indian uh, indian heart journal european heart journal cath intervention and uh, welcome dr professor sanjay tyagi to the session and yeah, the morning. next chair person is uh, dr manoj kumar he is uh, holding the position of director cardiology and hod cath lab max patpat ganj hospital new delhi and he is also the renowned interventional cardiologist and national figure having the more than 25 years of experience and he has done extensive work in complex angioplasties like left main bifurcation rota ablation intravascular imaging i am heading the department and, uh, having the awards uh, like the uh, the dp basu young investigator awards in the cs annual conference dr kalam national icon award rajiv gandhi ratna uh, puraskar award even sujoy b roy award in 2008 csi delhi he was an active member in the csi delhi national csi also a member of the indo european uh, interventional counseling he has done the numerous research having more than 40 publications in reputed journals both national and international okay. welcome dr monosh to the session 
and the third chairperson for this session is Dr. Pramod Kumar. He is holding the post of director and HOD Medanta Hospital partner. He is also a renowned international cardiologist in India, having more than 30 years of experience. He is, he is an expertise in sim, simple and the complex pacemaker implantation, balloon bulbotomies, peripheral angioplasties, management of structural heart disease, etc. And he also the conferred various awards like best research award in Delhi CSI, best case award in the TCD San Francisco, also been awarded the Times Editor Choice in 2014. Also, he has in more than 50 publications to his name in the all the leading national and international journal. Now I am hand over uh, this session to the Dr. Pramod, uh, Dr. Manoj Kumar to carry forward the sessions and introduce our speaker and the panelist to looking forward to you. Welcome, sir. Good Over morning, everybody. I congratulate uh, Dr. Naveen Bhamri, Dr. Sudhan Shu, and Dr. Devinder for organizing such an excellent conference and for doing such a good, excellent work in the field of interventional cardiology. We feel very proud of them. And now they have organized such an educative conference on this Teacher's Day. So once again, my congratulations to them. I think this is a case in box and you can start presenting your case. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So, uh, Dr. Yes. Monoj will just introduce a little bit and we'll carry forward. So, shall we begin, sir? I think you should begin, I think. We are already so late this, this case in the box is basically a lesion with high calcium content, LSCC. Uh, as we all know that uh, LSCC, high calcium content lesions uh, by using percutaneous technique is a complex because of the increased risk of incomplete lesion preparation and uh, suboptimal stent deployment. So there is there may be higher chance of acute and chronic failure. So this is the case of calcified LED lesion case in the box. So this is a uh, recorded case. Uh, uh, here now we have a 65 year old female who is a hypertensive lady. And she comes to the OPD saying that she has uh, uh, angina on exertion. She gets a feeling of substernal heaviness when she walks few steps and need to stop. So the lady is hypertensive, not a diabetic, not a smoker. Uh, on preliminary investigations, her echocardiography is having a normal ejection fraction, no regional wall motion anomaly, normal heart walls. Uh, ECG is like an active ischemia. So we advise the patient to undergo a CT coronary angiogram. So the lady goes for the CT coronary angiogram and the first thing which we find is that it has a high calcium score, a calcium score of more than 600. And then there is a uh, dense calcified plaque in the proximal LED causing almost 90% stenosis. So uh, presuming that this is the cause of the patient's angina and since the CT coronary angiogram is significantly positive for the anatomy, anatomical disease, we took the patient on the table and did a coronary angiogram. So uh, Gagan explained you the uh, brief history of the patient on the basis of the history she is having uh, calcific LED lesion which is a long lesion on the basis of CT coronary angio and uh, imaging of the you know the fluoroscopy also shows that there is a tram track calcification in the LED which we can see because even without contrast injection and the calcium score is more than 600 that is also suggestive of heavily calcific lesion because if you go through the EBCT scoring, if it is more than 400, it means a severe calcific lesion is there. So what should be the plan, Dr. Devinder? In heavily calcified lesion, uh, for properly assessing the lesion, ideally we should go for intravascular imaging with the help of OCT or IVAS. But this lesion is quite uh, critically stenosed and it is difficult to pass a imaging catheter through this, this stenotic lesion. So, dealing with the calcium is very important in these coronary lesion because stent expansion is the most important predictor for long-term uh, prognosis for stent thrombosis and restenosis. So, we want to achieve the maximum expansion of the stent and for achieving that, uh, debulking of these lesion is very important. And uh, debulking of these calcium calcified lesion can be done mostly in two ways by rota ablation for the intraluminal lesion and uh, with IVL for abluminal lesion. Yeah, you are absolutely right, Devinder. So uh, our strategy would be like this because he is absolutely right that you cannot pass imaging catheter through, through this tight lesion. So first we shall go with the uh, rota ablation. What should be the birth size, Dr. Sudhanshu? 
uh, break that calcium by the IVL. So my strategy will be after OCT we have to decide for this whether to go for the IVL or not. On that basis we have to go for then after that stenting and followed by the rotin angioplasty. We can use directly uh, you know the atherectomy devices in the form of balloon. There are you know the debulking balloons like uh, Flexton is available, you can use the uh, angioscalp. So my strategy will be going to rota because uh, as you can see in the angiogram, the proximal lesion is very tight, that is more than 90%. And to pass through this lesion, we need to debulk fast things uh, so that this angioscalp or other devices has to be passed freely or else it may get entrapped in the device, entrapped in the lesion. See, uh, the fluoroscopy image yeah, the before the the dye goes in, shows the, the le whole length of lesion from the ostial LED till the mid LED, around 50 millimeter more length of the lesion is quite calcified and the calcium is quite significant. Passing a rotavaya directly can uh, prevent a step of microcatheter exchange and all those, but uh, this has a drawback that if the rotavaya gets kinged uh, or there is a minor then bend, suck up then it can lead to future... Uh, so let's, let's start an angio, uh, let's do an angiogram first. So this is the, uh, you can see the coronary angiogram in the areocaudal view and the uh, uh, PA cranial view. So we are using the 7 French guiding catheter through the femoral route. This is an EBU guiding catheter. We need an extra support, that's why we use this. Where, please? So this is check angiogram. Soft PTC wire. Followed by micro catheter. Yes, yes. Micro So 8000 heparin given. Work of BMW choice PT wire. And we are using the fine cross catheter. So if you see the hemodynamics, patient is having pulse of 73 per minute. And the pressure is, she is 170, 90 pressure. Saturation is 99. So overall, the hemodynamics are good. We are into the LED. There we are crossing the legion, we have crossed the legion with the workhorse wire. Radio opaque portion of the wire is around 27 millimeter here. Yeah. So we think that again the legion estimated is around 48 or 50 millimeter or something. So we need, we need a long stent or a two stent. So uh, while passing the rota wire, we should be very careful that it should not kink because if the wire gets kink, then you may land up in the trouble sometime while passing the bar so we have decided to use 1.5 millimeter bar and uh, uh, this system uh, is comes with a preloaded system uh, so we need not to attach uh, the bar with the rota advancer the approximate size of the led distal led is approximately 2.75 to 3 millimeter so the bar size jo ratio is bar to artery ratio should be 0 0.5 so that's why we are using 1.5 bar in this case. If needed, we can upgrade this to, you know, 1.75 if needed, I think. So now we are with the rota wire inside the distal LED. So now we are into the distal segment of the LED. Now we are going to take out the you know ablation of more than 10 to 15 seconds we have to stop in between and you know we are using the you know uh, ready-made flush wire so we are checking the rota before going inside dyna close uh -huh. one forty tak jayenge maximum bas 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 you can see here we are checking the rota bar outside the artery. Ek bar check karna. Yeah, yeah. Fine, fine, fine. So we are going inside. There are few cardiologists we are uh, that. So, so now we have uh, we have crossed the legion successfully we'll just, uh, without any interruption. So we are checking it to see for the any slow flow, no flow phenomena. Everything is wide, but still you, know, you can see the tightest point where the, there is a bar. So we are planning to give one more run of the rota at this point. Look at the speed. Center, center, rota.
This is the dangerous point actually. Yeah, you Okay. Chopping mm -hmm. door. So we are done with the rota. Pressure is fine. Now we will pass the micro catheter again for the exchange to exchange the wire. Now we are out with the micro catheter wire sure. inside. Sure, balloon deflate. Balloon deflate. Deflate the balloon. Deflate. Balloon is out now. So now we are going to do imaging to look for the uh, diameter of the vessel, length of the uh, legion, and the we are going to see whether that calcium has broken or broke or not. So now we are on with the dragonfly catheter inside the. LED. This 50 millimeter is the length of these proximal two marker. The distal black marker is the tip of the catheter. So even we can have with the 55. So we are injecting the dye. Shoot. So this is you can see the distal end of the LED. This is clear. Now you can pull it back. You can see the dense calcification from you know the 9 o'clock to, to 3 o'clock position now you can see the dissections you can see the length of the calcification is more than 5 millimeter depth is approximately 10 millimeter 1 millimeter it's more than 0.5 yeah so lot of calcium this is heavily calcified legion i think we must use uh, the circumferential calcium uh, in this OCT image. Vascular lithotripsy or shockwave lithotripsy, you can see 360 degree calcium in this image. So we need to debulk further. Uh, what do you say, uh, Sudhanshu and Devinder? Uh, already we have uh, debulking with the uh, rota ablation and we have created space. Now we can see by this OCD image that a uh, lot of uh, intramural and uh, extraluminal calcification is there and it is heavily calcified. So we need to debulk further. So IVL is uh, needed uh, at this case. Uh, I think that will be a better option. So the house opinion is we should take a 3 millimeter IVL, 3 into 15? 3 into 12. 3 into 12. So we are going to use the IVL now. Because there is a circumferential calcium, we are we can see the so beauty of the IVL is we can break the uh, inter, uh, intimal as well as medial calcification with this break. You can we can you know this IVL balloon can give you uh, a pressure up to 50 atmosphere. So that is the beauty of the IVL over rota. I'm just press it. So now we are going inside with the IVL 3 into 12 millimeter balloon. Let's hope for the best that this will cross easily. Let's see. Holding the wire? Yeah, holding the wire. So strategy will be, we will come from uh, uh, distance to Can you make proximal. little uh, RO cranial? And this is a little uh, bit bulkier balloon, but once we cross it, we are going to achieve the results what we are looking for. Just show me the guide, please. Guide tip. And we are taking this uh, IVL print. Uh, 360 is the one that is used in the middle. 360 degree. And uh, just crossing, uh, crossing this laser. 20 mm proximal to distal. And I think it is easily crossed this laser. And we just need to check the. Yeah, so we uh, are inside the LED. At the, at, uh, we should go distally, uh, Sudhanshu. Starting from distal will? Yeah, yeah. Crossing okay. So we are having 80 pulses. We are use, we can use 20, 10, 10 pulses distally and proximally we can use up to I 40 pulses. So strategy should be we should inflate it at 4 atmosphere. We can start from this point, I guess. Pull, pull. We can pull it. So IVL, we deliver the electrical pulses. So you can see in the ECG, so there is a ventricular capture because this electrical 
uh, energy can lead to myocardial Stop. stimulation. Store this image. So first pulse given successfully. We'll Just move. pulling the little bit of uh, proximal. Yes. And uh, again, uh, go to four atmosphere. Four. Yeah, four. Okay, start. Ready? Press. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Done, sir. And Deflect. store this deflat. Thora, sir. We'll just check this position of this balloon. Ready? Stop that. Ready, start. Ten, ten, ki do. Ten, ten, ki do. Bar de do. So here we are going to deliver two. 10 10 pulses after interval. Done. Step store the. And again, uh, just to. We'll taking a little bit proximally, and here we have to uh, give the maximum start. Inflated 4. Again, the inflated 6. This time we will go a little bit of higher. So stresses. this time we will go up to 6 atmosphere, 6 start ATM. Pulses. And now we are. Start pulses. Done. So Start. now we will so come out. I think I'll just check the balloon movement, and I think we have. Badia. The lumen was also expanded. You can see here very nicely uh, LED. Yeah. What about the new proximal new diameter? I think it's 3.5. So, we, uh, what do you say, uh, Sudhanshu? We should Still go with a single stent or a two no, stents? No, I think so. Two stent strategy is better because we have a uh, disparity of the proximal diameter 3.5 and it is 3. And another thing is, it is borderline. We have the highest length of around 48, I, I guess. Uh, Okay, so you want to try. You want to try with a single stand first. There is two, three millimeter missing. I'll further push the stand. Take another stand. Okay, you will start with this one stand strategy. One stand strategy. So, so we so we take three forty eight. Then start. Give so us the a house opinion is three forty eight. Three forty eight. Zion's expedition. We are very comfortable with this uh, stand. Take short. So we are able to <laughs> go inside <laughs> <laughs> easily <laughs> without <laughs> any interruption. Easy view me karao. Are you cordon me karao? Proximal usme tapering achhi dikhai de rahi hai. I think we are deep inside. We need to pull it now. Abhi bhi extra pull kar sakte hain. We can pull. Ah, theek hai next. So pressure is okay. One sixty ninety. Niche tak dikhao. So now we are going to take a shoot. बहुत बढ़िया मार. Crystal edge क्या है? Excellent. Turn off. Balloon inside this stand by using stand boost technology. We are quite inside, I think. Go up. Go. Pandra. Sixteen. Pandra, Tola, sir. Eighteen. Eighteen. We have done with the final OCT image, and we are okay because then there is no mal position seen. There is no distal and proximal edge dissection. So this is we are, uh, you know, the OCT. We are very happy with the OCT image now, and uh, we'll take a final shoot, and we'll come out. Uh, I think, uh, what do you say? Uh, are you satisfied, Dr. Devender? Yeah, OCT image shows good. Are done with the 200 uh, ml contrast. I think this is acceptable with the normal renal function. So, so I have forwarded a little bit because we are running short of time. So, <coughs> this was the uh, LED lesion with high calcium content, and we did a rota tripsy that is rota ablation followed by lithotripsy. Uh, and the result was uh, to us, yes, it was excellent. Uh, what is the house opinion now? We are not able to hear you, sir. Manoj, your audio is not coming. I, I think it's an excellent result and a very good uh, demonstration of the combination of the two techniques of 
uh, rota as well as Dr. the IVL, like what Dr. Naveen said, the rota tripsy. Uh, hopefully, it is not rota tipsy. Rota tripsy is <laughs> is 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 actually very important. You know, we always thought that uh, uh, they are all competing with each other, the rota and the uh, IVL. But here is a very good example where you have seen that they are complementary to each other. And as Dr. Devendra and uh, <clears throat> Dr. Parida explained very well that, you know, the intraluminal can be taken care of by the rota, but the one which is in the media or in the adventitia or deep can't be taken care of by the rota. So beautiful example of the combination of the two techniques and excellent result as expected from Dr. Naveen and his team. Thank you very much, sir. Mm -hmm. Sir, any, any other question? Uh, Dr. Naveen, if you can hear me. Yes, 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 Dr. Vivek. Uh, I, first of all, I must again uh, repeat uh, the, the congratulations bestowed upon you, very deservedly so. Uh, right from the outset, the decision, the clinical, uh, the points that you pondered over before going into this uh, particular difficult sort of a case. So could you also propose... Uh, a, a short summary or an algorithm for such the management of such calcified lesions? Yes, sir. Very nice question. Actually, pertaining to this case and uh, cases with lesion with high calcium content. So there is a classical algorithm uh, uh, mentioned. So you first have to see whether it is a balloon crossable lesion or not. If it is yes, then pre-dilate the lesion and do an imaging. If uh, on imaging like OCT, if the calcium arc is more than 180 degree, if the length of the lesion is more than five millimeter and the thickness of the lesion is more than 0.5 millimeter lesion, more than 0.5 mm millimeter, then uh, then it then there will be a uh, if if it is yes, if the calcium score is high, it is four or three or four, then you have to go because the deep calcium is there. Then the you can go directly with the intravascular lithotripsy if it is not if there is a superficial calcium also then you can go with the rota ablation then pre dilate again if the if the optimal result is there go with the stent deployment if suboptimal then can you can switch over to lithotripsy again or if the calcium thickness is not like uh, the score is one or two, then you can use a scoring balloon or a uh, Wolverine balloon or NC balloon and then go uh, if the, uh, then pre dilate the lesion. If the result is optimal, you can go directly for the stent or if suboptimal, then you again have to use the IVL and then deploy the stent. So if the balloon uncrossable lesion, then you have to cross.